Thank you, Nessa. Nice to be here in this close weather. Um, if I don't speak loud enough, let me know. Can I speak quietly? And if I use any UK references, because um, I'm based in London, that don't, you don't get, just give me a shout and let, I'll explain it. But I'll, hopefully it'll be clear. So yes, uh, um, Monumental Lies is my latest book. And in it, I argue that if we read a city carefully enough, it will tell us about our past. Just like a book in a library shelf or an archive document. Um, monuments, architecture and cities are the evidence of history. What's more, the city's constituent elements from the palace to the slum are material evidence. Actual physical traces of past events as well as witnesses to previous ways of thinking. Embedded within them, these containers of our daily lives are politics, economics and the value and values that may be very different from ours, but which are still having their effect today. As Hannah Arendt observed, the reality and reliability of the human world rests primarily on the fact that we are surrounded by things more permanent than the activity by which they were produced. So when our cities are reshaped as fantasies about the past, and monuments and statues tell lies about who or what events deserve immortalization, the historical record is being manipulated. When we are told falsely that certain architectural styles are alien to our culture or that people naturally prefer to live among their own kind, the reliability of the world is called into question. Our streets and squares are not the morally neutral, inert assemblages of brick and stone they pretend to be. Even absences can be telling. We need only look around us and see, or not see, the memorials to female achievement or the black experience or LGBTQ plus lives. For those with the power and money to place a likeness on a pedestal, monuments are more often a, ch a tool to obscure the real facts of the real facts of history, to shape a chosen narrative, to invent national and civic traditions, and to enforce imagined, imagined communities that extend only to those deemed to belong. Statues of genocide heirs and colonial mass murderers are put up in squares and on street corners for edification. Monuments tell deliberate, calculated lies, and they are lies that are being marshalled in the culture wars. The term culture war well, it has antecedents in things like Kulturkampf in, in, in Germany, but the modern term of culture war has often been ascribed to Pat Buchanan speaking at the 1992 Republican Convention in the aftermath of the LA uprising that followed the acquittal of LAPD officers for the brutal beating of Rodney King. Buchanan called for a war for the soul of America. He said it is, quote, a, it is a cultural war, a, as critical to the kind of nation we will one day be as was the Cold War itself. He called for US cities to be taken back street by street, presumably taken from people of color. The 1980s and 90s version of the culture wars often took the form of accusations of political correctness. Uh, these aimed, as the anti-woke campaign does today, to stymie progress on social justice and reverse its gains. So we are not so much in the middle of a brand new culture war as deep amidst the latest campaign. Um, with capitalism and the planet in crisis and neither the mainstream uh, parliamentary or, 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 or um, Stenet or Republican, right or left, able to effectively solve this permanent crisis, culture wars are a useful distraction from demands for economic change and material gains. On the one hand, there's a post-9-11 fearfulness of the other, a neoliberal land grab of the public realm and the rise of nationalism and nativism. And on the other, the black, feminist, decolonial and queer critiques of the monumental canon that are having some success in changing the conversation. Activists are demanding not just more and better statues, but the toppling of stone and bronze street corner killers that have been used to whitewash reputations and justify the stolen fortunes of entire continents. Historic places and commemorative landscapes have both been contested over and over again down the centuries, but this time around, architecture and heritage are on the culture wars front line. And often a telling sign that a monument to an individual or an event isn't what it seems is that it was erected decades or even centuries after the fact, 
and you'll be all very familiar with the Confederate uh, monuments in the US. This is, um, I think, in New Orleans being winched away. Um, uh, but these statues only began to be erected after formally, the formerly enslaved began to assert their freedoms and make political gains in the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War. Uh, Manny mentioned that white, su white supremacists then shifted the focus of their monument building from the grave side, from the war memorial in the cemetery, to the center of American towns and cities, often the courthouse square where power was exercised by organizations such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And these obelisks and generals and metal foot soldiers were not acts of mourning in the cemetery. Instead, they aimed to assert control over Jim Crow era segregated public space. They were territorial markers. Many are erected in the 1920s, almost half a century after the Civil War, during another period when African Americans were asserting their rights following the First World War. Um, and you will probably recognize Stone Mountain with a kind of strange perspective because it's absolutely huge. Um, if you don't know, well, Stone Mountain is in Georgia. It has strong Ku Klux Klan associations. One incarnation of the KKK was founded on top of the mountain. Uh, and there are massive images of three Confederate leaders, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. And it's the largest base relief sculpture in the world. Um, a person can stand in a horse's mouth. The idea was begun in 1914 and work stopped and started um, it, until 1928, but it was only in 1954, following Brown versus the Board of Education, a blow to segregation and the birth of the Civil Rights Movement, that Stone Mountain was bought by Georgia in 1958 under a segregationist governor, Marvin Griffin. Work recommenced on the sculpture in 1964 and it was completed in 1972. That's in my lifetime. There was a plantation theme park at the foot that opened in the 1960s, where the enslaved were called hands or workers rather than slaves. The killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2019 has accelerated a pre-existing revisionist trend that has seen the toppling of these statues and others across the world, especially those honoring figures associated with slavery or colonialism. And viewed through the lens of social, social justice, this is a timely response to the partial and prejudicial history that these commemorative monuments symbolize. From the perspective of the conservative right, however, removal can af amount to form of woke grievance archaeology or cancel culture. It is not. This is simply the consequence of lies about the past finally being called to account and demand that the commemorative environment of the present reflect larger truths and a more accurate history. Um, it's a different dynamic across the Atlantic. Ooh, is that a bit fuzzy? Hopefully you can see it. Um, that's Edward Colston in the middle of Bristol in the west of England, which was uh, once Britain's chief slaving pot from the middle of the 18th century, where the horrific realities of the triangle trade were offshored as much as possible. You didn't really have slavery onshore in Britain, it was, it was in the colonies. Um, here, Edward Colston had been the city's most honored son at the center of Bristol's self-identity as a city made admirable by a legacy of charitable giving. Philanthropy, essentially, he was a philanthropist. He, he used the money from slavery to, um, um, to build hospitals, schools, and there's many named in his honor, stained glass windows in the cathedral praising him. Um, and um, Colston uh, commemorations inclu also included this statue here, toppled by Black Lives Matter activists in the summer of 2020. And at the same time, nearby Colston Hall, was uh, the name was changed as well. Um, so yet when El Edward Colston died in 1721, it was after a lifetime leading the Atlantic slave trade, where he was complicit in the deaths of many tens of thousands of Africans branded and shipped in the, conditioning, in the conditions of the Middle Passage. Like with all Confederate statues, appearances are deceptive here too. The toppled Colston bronze was not put up by a grieving citizenry immediately after his death in 1721. It was erected in 1895. 
more than 170 years later, and half a century after the slave trade ended in most of the British Empire. This and other statues were raised as part of a consciously shaped cult of Colston, promoted by Bristol's merchant elite. While defending the mercantile narrative of the city's imperial history, the cult at that time was not so much about enforcing racial op uh, oppression locally, there were not that many black Bristolians in the 19th century, it was about more about patrolling class, and Colston was a historical figurehead useful in creating a paternalist and cross-class civic narrative in the face of rising industrial rest and labour organisation. That merchant elite is still operating in Bristol. In recent years, it lobbied heavily against changing the plaque at the base of the statue. The statue is still here, but the surroundings are entirely different because the city was bombed in the war. Um, so this, the, these, these merchant elite clubs, they, they lobbied really hard about have, uh, fixing a new, more truthful plaque um, that would have told more about Colston's bloody history. Yeah, and this is something local campaigners have been pushing for for decades without success. So, when their attempts to get the truth about Colston told were blocked again by this foot dragging by the city council and then by the Merchant Venturers Elite Gentlemen's Club, they took matters into their own hands and rolled Colston into the same harbour from which his slave ships departed. This was poetic justice and we should support the protesters. But my book is arguing for a different response, a layered interpretation at scale that does not allow these problem monuments to remain standing uncorrected, uh, the honour given left in place, but which also sees them as important for the, historical, for the historical record. Firstly, though, we have, if we accept that, that buildings and monuments can be artefacts that are the evidence of history, uh, problems arise if that material is not authentic. So um, this is um, uh, Auschwitz, this is Crematoria 1. It's actually a reconstruction. Um, Crematoria 1 operated from August 1940 in a pre-war ammunition bunker adapted for its function. And when the four gas chambers at Birkenau adjacent to Auschwitz went into operation, the camp authorities transferred the mass killings there and gradually phased out the first gas chamber at Crematoria 1. Its furnaces and chimneys were later dismantled and the holes in the roof used for introducing Zyklon B pellets were closed. Those chambers at Birkenau were later blown up at the end of the war by the retreating Nazis as the Red Army approached. They were covering their tracks. Holocaust deniers, though, have infamous, infamously taken a no-holes, no-Holocaust position, falsely arguing that there were no holes in the collapsed concrete slabs of Birkenau gas chambers to deliver the gas pellets. No holes, they argue, no gas chambers, no Holocaust. Unfortunately, and, and, and this is the ruins of one of the genuine um, um, gas chambers at Birkenau, Route Crematoria 2, Unfortunately, Holocaust deniers have been given some unwitting material to argue with that Auschwitz was a fake. This is because Crematoria 1 was reconstructed after the war when Auschwitz became a memorial and a museum. And it was reconstructed partly because there was a Polish narrative that ab about primary victims and how victimhood uh, and it was then under Stalinist control and partly because Birkenau was a long way from the main site and tourists were too lazy to walk to the genuine ruins. So they reconstructed the furnaces, the chimneys and the roof with the holes um, and gave Holocaust deniers an in. The official Auschwitz website still says this object is preserved in an original state to a large degree, but this is not true. And when you give conspiracy theories an in, they'll take it. The reconstructed architecture is telling us lies. No, hol no Holes, No Holocaust was at the heart of the libel trial in which disgraced historian, a UK historian, David Irving, sued Debbie Lipstadt and Penguin Books um, because she called him a Holocaust denier, essentially. Um, Dutch arch architectural historian Robert Jan van Pelt testified at the trial, amassing hundreds of pages of evidence from the ruins themselves 
construction drawings, invoices for building materials and other documentation to prove the presence of the gas chambers. Fortunately, Irving lost his case in the face of this overwhelming evidence and the no holes, no holocaust has been comprehensively refuted and a few years later the actual ho real holes in this ruin were found. Uh, and organisations such as Forensic Architecture and my work have been inspired by Van Pelt's work. It shows that the devil really can be in the detail and the details matter and they have to be authentic. Um, this is Dresden, the Neumarkt. Uh, everything you can see in that image from the cobbles to the buildings to the church is a fake. Mostly mo completed in the last few years. Um, um, and, and many worry that we're in a post-truth age where emotion and beliefs have a achieved primacy over reality. But on the face of it, architecture should be immune from such post-truth forces because there would appear to be nothing more indisputable evidence of the form of the present and the shape of the past than a weighty and long-standing building. The very physicality of architecture, its relative longevity, gives the impression of certainty. And what you see is what you get. Lack of complication. Reality, Philip K. Dick reminds us, is that which you, when you stop believing it, doesn't go away. As we saw from Crematoria 1, we cannot always take buildings at face value. But nonetheless, the architectural is a useful dupe for those wishing to manipulate the present by misusing the past. Because um, the apparent outward impassivity of non-figurative structures is particularly effective in disguising its ideological content. So in a context where anti-cosmopolitans are on the offensive, the foolish belief that this townscape is disinterested makes, it manip makes its manipulation an effective weapon against the truth. The architectural and the commemorative environment thus has a much underestimated role in fostering and cementing falsehoods in history. It's a tool that renders these falsehoods physical, making them harder to refute. When buildings and monuments are inauthentic, Arendt's test of reliability becomes undermined. So you'd think that then that demands for authenticity would be heightened in the present, but instead we're moving away from the concept. Um, and as I say, everything you see there is a fake. Um, the Frauenkirche was reconstructed in 2005 and then the rest of the old square was reconstructed afterwards. And Dresden used to be known as the Florence on the Elbe for its Renaissance beauty, and it's become Las Vegas on the Elbe. Newmark is not just the focus of tourist visits. Anti-Islam political group Pegida and neo-Nazis marched the Frauenkirche construction site, and uh, uh, it, it has become a, a, a place of pilgrimage, uh, as have other places in Germany, uh, for the far right. And it's in Germany, perhaps, where the culture wars have taken on their most architectonic character. Here, as part of a concerted attempt to rebuild the Blitz city, as a histori historicist pastiche, we are seeing not only the rehabilitation of classical architecture, for a while entirely tainted by Third Reich associations, but also the rebuilding of entire long-vanished parishes, parish palaces, churches, and whole quarters or city centres, as if Hitler had never happened. Um, in 2009, UNESCO struck uh, Dresden off the list of World Heritage Sites. But it was not because of this fakery, it was, it was struck off for a bridge across the Elbe, away from the city centre. So, and, and another one, that, or, or just completing, is the tower of the Garrison Church in Potsdam, a site of militarism and lots of strong Third Reich associations and right, righteous groups are busy rebuilding that building. The Humboldt Forum in Berlin is, is another example and, they, and they're not ideologically neutral. Uh, these purposely forgetful efforts are often linked to Germany's right and far right as I said and political parties such as the Alternative for, Do for Germany, the AFD. And so in Frankfurt, here's an example, this was a, a, a technical town hall um, reconstructed after the city was bombed in the Second World War. This is the same area today 
uh, a sort of Hans Christian Andersen, you know, Grimm Brothers fantasy of, of, of what Frankfurt looked like. And some, some incorporates some actual fragments of historic fabric, but this is all brand new. And in places you can see things like the insulation poking out the edge. Um, this, this is an ideological war underway masquerading, masquerading as a style war. Modernism, whose record at its utopian best was about building for a more egalitarian post-war world. And it's to, today it's under attack by resurgent and reactionary architectural traditionalism. Arguments over beauty are a Trojan horse concealing a desire to impose conservative historicism and values. Of course, no particular architectural style has an intrinsic political value. Uh, it doesn't, classicism is not intrinsically reactionary, modernism isn't intrinsically uh, uh, progressive, and they're both used in various ways over time. Instead, architectural style are put to political uses. It's useful, for example, for the right to demonise modernism as a style promoted by cosmopolitan elites, when they don't want to fund the architectural infrastructure of a welfare state or build social housing. Horizontally proportioned windows rather than austerity are then the problem. Unfortunately, under the influence of a political expediency and in the wake of a postmodern theory hostile to historical materialism and what it sees as, tot as totalising theories, essential concepts that have been valued for more than a century and promoted by the likes of socialist William Morris are being abandoned. Morris's ideas are set out in the 1877 Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings Manifesto, later found their way into key international conservation documents, the Charter of Athens, 1931, and the Charter of Venice, 1964, that demanded authenticity in preservation and reconstruction. For example, intellectual honesty in being able to visibly separate new work from old. However, previously pri precise terms such as reconstruction or restoration are being used without their old position and are being undermined by potentially useful but ethically fraught and unregulated technologies such as digital copies that offer a superficial faux authenticity. Um, this is Mostar Bridge reconstructed, uh, city of Mostar. Uh, the rot starts at the top. In UNESCO's case, this is about political convenience, misjudged attempts at post-conflict reconciliation, and a desire to resist iconoclasts such as Daesh or ISIS. In 2001, the notion of rebuilding the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan was deemed unacceptable fakery by UNESCO. But only a few years later, the organisation embraced rebuilding in the name of myths of their recon reconciliatory role, and must our bridges at a prime example, 16th century Starry Mosque, Ottoman bridge in the city that connected a, a, a largely um, a Bosniak, Bosnian Muslim eastern half and Croat Catholic western half. wasn't quite as straightforward on that as that. Um, on the 9th of November 1993, uh, the bridge collapsed under shelling from the Croats. Um, and in an attempt to unite the divided city of Mostar, UNESCO back to World Bank project to rebuild it, We're back funded project. It opened in July 2004 and was constructed of largely new material assembled in traditional ways. But despite appearances and the symbol and the sim symbolism of bridging communities either side of the river, the city remains as, as desired, divided as ever. Reconstruction as reconciliation, in this case at least, is an illusion. Uh, there are in the city uh, an example like a school building where Muslim and Croats operate within the one building, uh, but they have separate classrooms, separate curricula, separate playtime, different bells. Um, only the loos are shared, uh, the, 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 the bathrooms. And that, 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 that's carried uh, on uh, in all sorts of ways across Mostar today, and lots of people are leaving city because of it and the population of Mostar is not even the same as, as the pre-war city. Lots of refugees left altogether, people from the countryside came in and, and, uh, and uh, uh, its whole demography is very different. Um, 
But that, re and I, I agree we should, we should reconstruct this bridge. We're resisting attempts to genocide, to genocide via culture, to, to, to destroy uh, the uh, Ottoman, the Muslim heritage of, uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina in a campaign of ethnic cleansing and cultural genocide. And one way of, of making their efforts futile is reconstruction, and that's understandable. However, the, even the reconstruction wasn't enough for UNESCO. In 2005, the rebuilt span and the reconstructed area around it was hastily declared a World Heritage Site. It's a designation that was only made possible by jumping through linguistic and conceptual hoops to ensure that the facsimile bridge made it past UNESCO's own strict authenticity criterion for World Heritage designations, a criterion that requires historic fabric to be actually historic. Um, declaring a 21st century structure a World Heritage Site a year after it was completed is making a nonsense of heritage and the authentic and of evidence of history. Similarly, in 2015, UNESCO declared the war ravaged Palmyra in Syria would be rebuilt without even having examined the damage. At the same time, the emphasis was put on the damage to Palmyra by ISIS, ISIL, and not that caused by Assad's forces and the Russians. Indeed, Putin's army was praised by UNESCO for recapturing Palmyra, ignoring his bombing of hospitals and civilian centres nearby. This can only have encouraged Putin, emboldened him. In its eagerness to frustrate iconoclasts such as Daesh, UNESCO has set aside fundamental principles and this is having real-world consequences today in the Ukraine. So, we have more data about the world, more measurements, more images of it than ever before in history. But we live in a time when verifiable facts are trashed as fake, as unreliable, along with the expertise that identifies them, and where even the heritage organisations are facilitating the confusion. Authenticity is a day in danger of a word being a word rendered meaningless by brand marketeers and pop psychologists, but which is too important to lose to such slipperiness. All manner of evidence is required if we are to successfully smash the mythology of colonialism and empire and have an honest reckoning with the past. We need to place historical materialism and material evidence alongside witness testimony at the core of this process rather than the more unreliable and problematic idea of memory, which may some come as a surprise to some of you because my last book was called The Destruction of Memory, but I think it's really important that we try and think about maybe sort of collective ideas or a civic consciousness rather than the idea of collective memory is too easily manipulated. And um, especially when evidence and facts uh, can, can demonstrate things in the way that memory, unreliable memory, can't. Yet in the UK, um, in the post-George Floyd phase of statue toppling, various commentators have claimed that statues and monuments are not even history. And this simply will not do. Yes, they can be bad history, but their very evasions can reveal deeper historical truths. The evidence supporting the historical record is not only words on a page, but also material artefacts. Leon Trotsky might seem an unlikely source of design wisdom, but he was an astute cultural observer and understood the role of architecture as a rec record of history. He wrote that the Renaissance, quote, only begins when the new social class, already culturally satiated, feels itself strong enough to come out from the yoke of the Gothic art, to look at Gothic art and all that preceded it as the material for its own disposal. And this is more than an elegant metaphor. He believed that architecture above all the arts revealed the dialectical processes of the arc of history. Now, if we accept these items, these objects, these artefacts are evidence, what should we do about them? Because despite all the lies and distortions, monuments can have a good faith purpose if suitably transformed from sites of honour into sites of shame or conscience, or reactivated as thinking sites, and some of these terms come from the German. Architecture, more generally, can help prove criminal responsibility for misdeeds such as ethnic cleansing and genocide. 
who dropped the barrel bomb, who shelled the bridge, who looted the museum and smashed its artefacts, who, at Grenfell Tower in London, allowed the wrapping of a high-rise housing with deadly inflammable, inflammable cladding, in the case of social murder. Where monuments were erected to the perpetrators of terrible deeds, they can tell us about the cynicism of the monument's backers. When erected to foster lies, they tell us that those lies are thought necessary. Certainly, though, this objectable landscape can't be left untouched. However, at the same time as needing to create a more equitable physical environment, we have a duty to ensure that we don't forget the ruling class has been perfectly willing to honour genocide heirs such as Cecil Rhodes or Christopher Columbus in our public spaces. The answers are not as simple as they may have first seem. Before we embark on a new iconoclastic wave, we need to acknowledge the many myths and misunderstandings about why our commemorative landscape is the way it is and about the great iconoclastic periods of the past, especially those that came at the end of totalitarianism. We need to go about this carefully so we forge a clearer understanding of the past while safeguarding the evidence, particularly where sites have become entangled in culture wars. And there are many complexities to iconoclasm, many grey areas, and people misuse the lessons of past iconic waves in order to justify new, new ones. And here's just here's one example of a, of a complex legacy. This is the mo mo monument to the Soviet army in Sofia in Bulgaria, built in 1954 on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the liberation by, of, of, of the state by a Soviet army. In 2011, the monument was painted overnight by a group of anonymous artists who called themselves Destructive Creation, who dressed the Soviet army soldiers as the American pop culture characters. Superman, you can see there, uh, I think Captain America, Ronald McDonald, Santa Claus in Coca-Cola mode. Um, and the caption score below means roughly in keeping with the times. And this inter intervention may be seen as a critique or a celebration of capitalist consumerism or a ca calculated insult to Soviet military militarism, or both. And Putin's regime was furious at the injury to their memorial, and the paint job was removed in the, within a few days. And given his bloody military campaign to impose authoritarian, authoritarian rule in places such as Chechnya, Syria, and now Ukraine, it might be a bit rich that Putin demands a Soviet war memorial be respected. But, but can we just dismiss the historical losses? Millions of Russians did die in the fight against fascism. Bulgaria was liberated, but it was also occupied. Both things are true. Um, and the, this is about to, memorial's about to be removed altogether. Um, and there are many complexities like this. Uh, Columbus in the States, uh, very important to Italian communities feeling able to be racialized as white. Uh, but for Native Americans, a genocidal catastrophe. Uh, we should remember that Trump sent in the National Guard to protect the Columbus statue in Chicago. How best then, to use German terminology, do we turn an Ehrenmal, a monument that honours, into a Mahnmal, one that symbolises shame or regret? I'd suggest a policy of subversive transformation demands a comprehensive recontextualization at scale that changes meanings, ideally in an additive layered way. These new layers should challenge but not entirely obliterate the monument so that its original meaning can be understood even if the honour is undercut. A small plaque and a QR code may offer some explanation but will not alone change the monument's public role or the context in which it operates. Um, so. The, this is Cecil Rhodes in Oxford, and this is like an example of no, what to do. Um, this was part of the Rhodes Must Fall Oxford ca campaign, the focus they wanted this statue to go. Cecil Rhodes was uh, a brutal colonialist in South Africa, murdered many people, helped uh, set up the roots of apartheid, and also uh, paid for this building. And he he very carefully uh, 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 curated his memory after, after his death. And so there was a long debate about what should be done at Oriel and a very bad faith response on b behalf of the college. Um, and so, and in the UK context, 
This is, stems from a Conservative government policy called Retain and Explain, which um, is a bad faith argument. They want to retain everything and explain little or nothing. Uh, and a, a transformative uh, uh, agenda uh, does not preclude change. It's more than a plaque. With just a plaque, the honour remains. You could do all sorts of artistic or architectonic interventions. I think the uh, sculptor Anthony Gormley suggested turning him round to face the wall like a schoolboy, a, a bad schoolboy. Um, and so this is what instead, this is what we get. A little plaque at the fo foot of the building with a QR code, sort of distancing the institution a little from the past. It changes nothing. So what are the alternatives? Um, there are many guerrilla and temporary interventions, off, not often not as elaborate as in Sophia, but still offering useful lessons. This is uh, Gladstone, a prime minister, former prime minister um, in, outside Bow Church in East London. For many decades, he's had his right hand painted bloody red. Who does it and why is unclear. If the paint is removed, guerrilla activists repaint the blood in secret. In recent BLM conscious years, the assumption has been made that the red paint is a commentary on the Gladstone family's links to plantation slavery. However, the longest standing tradition is that it's a reference to the match girl workers' strike, a famous strike at the nearby Barrington Main match factory. And the statue is paid for by the factory's owners in gratitude for a U-turn on the proposed match tax and erected in 1882 in Gladstone's own lifetime. And it's an urban myth that the match girls had to pay for the statue out from stoppages from their wages. But this myth may be, have been the initial reason for the red right hand, along with the commemoration of the successful 1888 strike that had figures such as Eleanor Marx and Annie Besant at its head. And the action is notable in the UK as a turning point for women in the labour movement. Um, Apparently, another plaque is to be erected nearby, commenting on the Gladstone's less savoury side. His family made the money from plantation slavery. But as at Oriel College, this does not challenge at scale the honour given to Gladstone. So how about a counter-memorial that provides another narrative, something commemorating the strike directly, or Eleanor and Annie, or the slavery connections, or in a truly intersectional approach, both. I mean, and there are other examples. This was the artist Banksy's suggestion for the Colston statue in Bristol, which has been now been moved to a museum. He suggested putting it back up in its battered state, but adding some more bronze statues of protesters, eternally pulling it down. So that day, when it was toppled, becomes, becomes the new monument. Um, there's another example here. This is in Baltimore, um, 2015. The artist Pablo Mascioli set up his mother, motherly loose figure, a uh, pregnant African-American maternal figure with a raised fist confronting a military monument to Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, a monument itself erected at the astonishingly late date of 1948 when white supremacists in the city were actively resisting desegregation. But... Uh, and then in 2017, the Lee Jackson Monument was among four spirited away on a flatbed truck by the city overnight. Vandals then attacked Madeleine Luce, scrawled on a history nearby. Um, after repairs, she was temporarily placed atop the, the empty plinth. But with the soldiers gone, her poignancy vanishes. The objects of her jacuzzi are no longer there. So how do we permanently turn sites of honour into into sites of shame. Examples of permanent recontextualization, relayering or reworking at scale are remarkably few. And this is a practice in its infancy. Uh, there's this one, which is um, Strozner uh, by Carlos Colombino. He basically broke up a massive monumental figure of the Paraguayan dictator Alfredo Strozner and sort of reassembled them between concrete blocks. Uh, is crushed and reconfigured, but still recognisable, and that speaks volume uh, about 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 the attitudes to the dictator. But this is, this is one of my 
very important example, I think, of successful uh, transformation at scale. This is um, part of a bas relief, a huge frieze, the largest surviving fascist artwork in Europe. It's massive. Um, it's in the southern Tyrol of northern Italy, an alpine town, um, which had a fascist new town grafted onto the old onto the old town. It included a big victory arch and colonnades, and this uh, is on uh, the side of the fascist headquarters, 198 square meters long. Um, it was actually only completed in 1957 for a visit from an Italian prime minister. It's quite astonishing. Um, there's a so there's a a, a a big debate about what to do with these problem monuments in in Bolzano or Bozen as it's called in German. It's a bilingual town, um, and um, they came up. Uh, there's a letter in 2010, and the possibility of change was agreed. And then in 2017, the change was implemented. Um, and it was very simple. They, they decided not to get, take the frieze down, not to obscure it altogether, but to hang these letters in front. And it's a phrase, uh, again, from Hannah Arant, uh, and it says, no one has the right to obey. And it's opposing the fascist dogma, the fascist slogan of believe obey, combat, which is carved behind it. And the wording is from a radio interview where Hannah Arendt paraphrased Kant while discussing her book about totalitarianism. The choice of words is a clever laid commentary on the fascist slogan. The monument is preserved, but its meaning has been changed by the addition of the condemnatory phrase. Arendt reminds us that we have an ethical duty to resist, that there's always a choice including whether we properly act to address contested heritage in ways that serve both justice and history. The minimalism of the intervention, the artists say, is a pointed contrast to the grand eloquence of, the fasc of fascist aesthetics. Truths have been told and an Aaron mal has been, become a man mal. And only a few years ago, uh, Bolsonaro had a fascist city councillors on it, on, from the, the uh, neo-fascist Casapan party, um, but more recently, in the national Italian elections, there was a low vote here for the Brothers in Italy, the Neo-Fascist Party. Um, how much is this due to changes to its monuments, or simply the fact of having a serious conversation about um, I, I, I think the monument itself and, and changes to it might have had mi little impact, some impact. The conversation, the process... Is, 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 is key. Because at the end of the day, aren't we giving, we can give these objects too much power. Figurative statues are simply the most attention seeking, the most visible aspects of heritage manipulation, and mostly visible only after their true meaning has been brought to our attention by diligent activists. There's a danger of culture war collusion in focusing attention on symbols when removal creates an illusion of change where systemic injustice continues unaltered. Isn't it mass incarceration rather than a problematic commemorative landscape that's the chief motor of contemporary Jim Crow? And even uh, activists in Charlotte, Charlottesville, where uh, a Confederate soldier was removed in front of the courthouse, recognised that, you know, might give the illusion of progress given that the same laws were being enacted within that courthouse. So we need to question the degree to which changing the built environment genuinely alters our lives and values. There are many uh, architectural deterministic delusions, cause and effect expectations about the impacts of monuments and of iconoclasm, or indeed of architecture and architectural style more generally, and us, on our politics and societies. Winston Churchill's oft-repeated remark that we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us is in truth a problematic oversimplification. There is an underlying thread of determinism here that architecture and design have heavily invested in and promoted the belief that design may simply... Uh, sorry, the belief that design may not simply build more equitable places that possibly shape lives, which it can, but will actually cause societal change 
rather than simply reflect it. It's a view that not only marginalises the agency of people in driving societal change, but peddles myths about our behavioural response to the physical environment that persists to this day. Arguably, these myths continue when we believe that a more progressive and inclusive monumental landscape will itself produce social change. Yes, we need to be able to separate truth from lies, not just online or in news bulletins, but in the built environment. Yes, we need to look at ways we can layer our monuments and our cities that turn sites of honour into sites of shame, that change the meaning of the past without losing altogether the vital evidence of that past from the public realm. But we must also distinguish between irrelevant symbolism and genuinely damaging ideology, between positive real-world political and socio-economic change and misguided architectural determinism. It's possible too that tolerating uncomfortable evidence might be easier within the context of real-world gains. And real change comes through the agency of people, not through changes to symbols or objects. Without such an approach, there's a real concern that we, in the name of progress, are paving the way for a dangerous Humpty, Bump, Dump, Dump, Humpty Dumpty populism, where truth, including truth in architecture, is whatever you say it is. If we fake or destroy the evidence, including that of the architectural record, how can we learn from it or guard it against the, guard it against those who would use an absence of the facts against us? Fundamentally, if we can no longer trust the tangible world around us to tell the truth, then we're in real trouble. We need to be able to trust the veracity of our built environment. Hannah Arendt can guide us here too. She warned that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exists. Evidence, including the material evidence of architecture, matters. Thank you.